Hello, and welcome to our third annual Zoom event of our four-part summer series. Thank you for joining us. I am curating our discussion today. I'm also very honored to serve as president of the Economic Club of Indiana for the upcoming season. As we look forward to the new season this fall, it's exciting to expand on the nine month signature luncheons and have the summer sessions also. The Economic Club's mission is to bring timely and engaging leadership perspectives from various industries and sectors on the economic and social impacts of current events. Before introducing today's guests, I would like to take a moment and thank you, thank our presenting sponsor, Lumina Foundation, and our, our outstanding group of platinum sponsors were highlighted in the beginning of uh, today's webinar. It is now my great honor to introduce our special guests. Today we are joined by the president of Purdue University and former Indiana governor, Mitch Daniels. Since taking the helm at Purdue in 2013, Mitch has been focused on addressing some very difficult challenges facing higher education today. As some of you know, Daniel's lifelong commitment to empowering the next generation of leaders has been advanced with the creation of the MDLF, the Mitch Daniels Leadership Foundation, whose mission is to build a network of innovators and leaders who refuse to accept the status quo as good enough who constantly aim higher and execute courageously. This is very quickly becoming the group that all the young execs in Indiana, Indiana want to be part of. So thank you for that and welcome Mitch. Thanks Kathy. We're also pleased to have with us today Butler University President James Danko. Becoming Butler's 21st president in 2011, Jim Danko has led a strategy to establish the university as a higher education innovator through the pursuit of many creative new programs. This advances Butler's core mission to integrate as a liberal arts foundation with career preparation and to strengthen Butler's founding principles of inclusivity, community engagement, and academic excellence. In 2013, Danko successfully advocated for Butler's membership in the Big East Athletic Conference, posi positioning the university and the company of outstanding peers in both the classroom and athletic competition. He now serves as chair of the Big East Board of Directors. Welcome, Jim. Also, we're happy to have with us today the executive director of Harvard Business School online program, Patrick Mullane bringing over 20 years of management experience across several industries, as well as a background with U.S. Air Force Intelligence. Mullane is responsible for managing Harvard Business School's online growth, expansion in global markets, and long-term success by leveraging the school's reputation for excellence and impact in business education and delivering it through a high-quality digital format. We can sort of claim Patrick also as a Hoosier because he received his bachelor's degree in mathematics from Notre Dame and then went on to get an MBA from uh, Harvard. So welcome, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Yep. Gentlemen, you are greatly respected on a national and global level, and we are really looking forward to hearing your important remarks around the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for higher education. Audience, uh, we want you to be part of the conversation. After we hear remarks from today's guests, we'll open the chat feature and work to allow some of you to be part of this dialogue. So just send us your questions. Jim Danko, can you kick us off? Glad to do so and thank you, Kathy. Appreciate uh, the Economic Club of Indiana for hosting this event and allowing me to be part of it and grateful for those of you that are paying attention and tuning in today. So uh, much different uh, Economic Club lunch than we've had in the past. Uh, but I thought maybe I just uh, uh, to frame some of the conversation a bit to share with you uh, some thoughts on uh, really the complexity of the decision making 
uh, process that confront higher education as we're trying to adapt to the current environment and, and address uh, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, 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 perhaps to give a, a, a sense of it, uh, I've used this uh, metaphor before, I, I think being a president of a university is like being a mayor of a small city, although maybe given the size of Purdue, maybe for Mitch, it's more like being a governor. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we, we have to uh, house and feed people on our campus. Um, we have sports teams on our campus. We have people on our campus responsible for safety, uh, healthcare. Uh, people visit our campus all the time. We've noticed increased number of visits this uh, these past few months as people like to use our campus as uh, somewhat of a public park. So in so many respects, and, and, and just given the diversity of people uh, on a campus like, like Butler, it is a small city and we have many things to think about, which really adds to the complexity of the decision-making uh, when you think about it. Uh, and of course, uh, for us uh, and any university president, it always starts with an understanding of uh, and caring for the best interest of, of your people. And what you find though too, is that there's sometimes competing interest uh, and you have different needs across different uh, constituent groups. And, and that has certainly been the case with COVID-19 and, and, and complicates the decision uh, making process. Uh, as, I, as I thought about even as, uh, as we've gone through different decisions over the course of time, if I dial the clock back to the second week of March, it's been occurring to me lately that in some respects it was easier making those decisions in, in the midst of a crisis. Uh, uh, at the time, you know, that second week of March in terms of where we were at uh, for Butler University, that was uh, spring break. So our students were off of campus as the thing really heated up. Uh, that second week of March, our basketball team and a group of cheerleaders and band members, alumni and staff, uh, we're in New York City awaiting uh, the start of the Big East Tournament, which was going to happen uh, later that week. Uh, and at the time uh, in New York City, why there I think was only one reported death, which was outside of New York City a bit, uh, there was uh, starting to be increasing anxiety about the seriousness of the situation. And in fact, on the eve of that Big East Tournament, March 11th, the NCAA announced their tournament was going to be played without fans. That uh, same day, the NBA suspended play. The next day, as we at the Big East, and you mentioned I, I, I chaired that committee, uh, we had a board meeting that uh, Thursday morning where the first half of the meeting, we were talking about how we were gonna be playing with no, uh, nobody in the stands. Um, but yet uh, by noon of that day, we had made the decision to pull our teams off the court and totally suspend play, which was consistent with the NCAA, consistent with the NBA. So uh, what, what you saw was at that point in time, there was a growing and strong alignment uh, in terms of people wanting to take swift action. And there was a lot of focus on distancing and protecting people. So there seemed to be a more common uh, interest. Uh, even uh, we saw it in New York City, we saw it here in Indy as well. So, so uh, as I reflect back to that, it seems somewhat what, uh, you know, a, a bit the de decision making was more straightforward. Now, as time has gone by, there seems to be a misalignment and in, in politics has entered the equation. And uh, as I get back to the point of being uh, responsible for different groups on our campus, there's different needs and interests and, and opinions across those groups. I, I would tell you right now, as we plan on opening in the fall, um, our students um, and their parents are very much interested in being back on campus. And there's some evidence out there. There was a good piece in, I think, uh, the New York Times or Wall Street Journal last week from Cornell saying that there's some advantage to having students uh, concentrated on campus. So you've got that group uh, that has those opinions. Of course, even across that group, not everybody agrees. But at the same time, uh, that younger generation, which might be a little bit more, uh, I could tell you right now around our campus, they don't seem to be as worried about it. They're, they're moving around, they're having parties. Uh, uh, whereas on the other hand, we have our staff and our faculty that are at, at a different age group and a, a different point in time, they're also gonna be part of that city, that community that comes together. So as we make those decisions now, well, we're listening to a lot of different opinions. Um, and, and, you know, again, we're focused on trying to get back to the way we'd like it to be. Now, certainly as we get back to campus in the fall, it will be a different experience. We have a lot of uh, new uh, 
processes in place. We have to worry about social distancing. We can't have large gatherings, events such as basketball and that would be a totally different thing. But nonetheless, we do want our students to experience that rich Butler education. We know that students gain considerably by being on campus and living and learning together. So we want that to occur. Uh, and at the same time, trust me that we're being very thoughtful about what the impact could be. And even as this COVID-19 situation changes from day to day, but I do find uh, the decisions we're making more complicated uh, and considering a lot more uh, external and internal forces than we would have uh, even early on during the crisis. So uh, again, for a private smaller university like Butler, it's complicated. Uh, we also have uh, uh, less uh, resources than other universities might have, and we're making a lot of investments in both technology and in safety and health issues for our campus. So let me leave it there and, and uh, let the other panelists make some comments. Thank you. Very insightful. It, it, it's changing all the time, right? Every day something different comes out. So, President Daniels? I'll pick it up where, where uh, Jim left it. Uh, uh, the, uh, we have seen a lot of changes in what's, what uh, seems like a long period. It's really a, been compressed into a few months. Um, I'll describe the situation as it evolved to here um, uh, by pointing out how very different a college campus is. In some ways, uh, the inverse of the, of the nursing homes where it took us a while, but we finally discovered that's really the epicenter and where to this date, uh, uh, something like 40% of all the deaths have occurred. And uh, we're, we're almost the inverse of that. I sometimes described it as uh, the population density of New York, uh, which mathematically is pretty close to what we are here at Purdue, uh, with the age demographics of Nairobi or uh, uh, some uh, very youthful um, African country. And the reason that that's so relevant, as we, it took a while to learn, but as we have seen and the data continues to display, uh, young people are extraordinarily uh, resilient to this compared to their elders and those with uh, a host of uh, or, a, or a number of, of uh, other health conditions about whom we have to be very, very worried. If it weren't for that medical fact, we wouldn't be opening. Um, we wouldn't even think about doing so. If, if this disease uh, had its uh, uh, dangerous effects or even lethal effects, uh, even somewhat evenly across the age a distribution. It, that, as we all know, those curves look very, very different. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, possibility for us, if we want to open, and for reasons I described, I believe we're, we are duty bound to open, uh, has to do with protecting uh, the vulnerable among us. And we're going to do that in a variety of ways. I notice now that uh, we're almost every uh, school in America has decided to uh, make the attempt to come back. There's also a convergence of tactics and techniques. So for instance, uh, more than half probably of our adult staff will not be on campus at any one point in time. We all learned about the uh, greater possibilities of telework across uh, all kinds of business sectors. We've seen it too. And um, uh, we believe that um, uh, several thousand of our um, adult uh, staff and faculty will simply not be here and not be exposed in that way. Those that are here will be protected in every way we know how. Uh, first of all, by distance. Uh, you know, um, I, I'm not being, I don't think, uh, facetious when I say that the safest place to be in Tippecanoe County uh, this fall might be in a Purdue classroom. Uh, that is to say that the, uh, the, the teacher uh, who will be there more often than not, not always, but if, if there, will be uh, a minimum of 10 feet from the nearest other person. That person, uh, presumably a student, will be wearing a mask, and we all know how important that is proving to be. There'll be plexiglass in between. The room will have been uh, cleaned uh, and, and ventilated in ways we didn't uh, used to do. Uh, we're gonna take every step possible. With all that, we know that the um, um, having students, uh, young people in close proximity is going to require an incredible amount of, co of uh, cooperation on their part. Um, we'll all find out together. There's a lot of understandable skepticism about whether young people uh, will uh, summon or maintain the discipline to wear masks, preserve distance, protect others. But we've told every student coming to planning to come to Purdue this fall as they are planning in record numbers 
that uh, if you don't think you can do that, please, uh, we have an option for you. We have an online option. Please just take it. Come when you uh, mm -hmm. are more comfortable. But um, uh, these and, and uh, dozens of other steps we can talk about, uh, we will take. Um, and uh, we believe it's our, as I said earlier, it's our duty to do so. Overwhelmingly, we find, as Jim mentioned, that young people and their parents believe that the, the uh, post-secondary uh, experience uh, cannot be fully replicated online and that uh, there, is, there are elements to the on-campus experience and the uh, interactive um, connection to faculty and others that are a very big part of it. And uh, so uh, we take it as our assignment in full view of how difficult this could be and that it might not work to make every attempt possible to um, not to interrupt their, uh, their uh, vital, uh, this vital uh, process of, of education and maturity that can come with uh, three or four years at Butler or Purdue or Harvard or elsewhere. So um, I'll just finish by saying that this uh, bears so much resemblance to many other decisions we've all had to make, um, but uh, maybe with higher stakes and, and uh, even longer odds. By that I mean um, every decision I ever encountered in business or public life or elsewhere had to be made with imperfect and incomplete information. And uh, w the, our information here is probably even less complete than we're accustomed to dealing with. And it's changing uh, as was mentioned. Um, uh, likewise, it's always easy to uh, uh, count or at least be fearful of the costs of action, but harder to calculate the costs of inaction, the cost of long-term consequences that uh, may outweigh any short-term gains that, uh, that a certain um, decision leads to. And this, uh, this has had those, uh, those uh, aspects in in, in high dimension. And I'll just finish by saying that if you keep your eye on the mission, and we believe it's our mission, if at all possible, to deliver a high quality, rigorous uh, preparation for life to thousands of young people who want to come to Purdue, uh, then um, you, you, you take the uh, calculated steps that are based on the information you have. And uh, that's our present intention. Well said. Executive Director Mullane. First of all, thanks again for having me. Uh, certainly feel like the undercard here with uh, Mitch and Jim, and it's really interesting to hear what's going on there. And it's it's eerily similar everywhere. I think I could say virtually the same thing all of them have said. I've been to some extent involved in how Harvard Business School is transitioning uh, during this time and the plans for the fall. Uh, really quickly, just a lay of the land at Harvard is made up of 11 schools which act very independently. Uh, there was a lot of news yesterday around Harvard doing a significant amount of teaching online. That refers specifically to the undergraduate portion of Harvard, Harvard College. Uh, the schools, though, are each given quite a bit of latitude uh, to do what makes sense uh, given their unique needs. Um, you know, for example, if you're running labs, you may have a different decision around what you're going to do with respect to people uh, being in person on campus versus if you're doing straight lectures to classrooms of students or other sorts of teaching. So the schools are given quite a bit of latitude to decide what they want to do. And at Harvard Business School, the decision is to try, uh, as with uh, Butler and Purdue, to get students back on campus in the fall. Uh, that said, we're investing significantly in technology um, in our classrooms, in inventing our own stuff, in fact, uh, to try and make the experience uh, great. One thing that I think... Um, we've all learned is that it's online isn't so bad uh, synchronous online where people are communicating with each other as we are right now isn't so bad when everybody's doing it in person is pretty good when everybody's doing it where it gets really challenging is when some people are present uh, physically and some people are not and so we've spent a lot of time trying to sort that out in our classrooms and are making good progress and hope that by the fall we'll be able to service students both on campus and off campus. About 30% of students come from overseas in the MBA program. Um, and I'm sure this is true uh, for all universities that that population in particular may be very difficult for them to get back to the United States um, and attend classes uh, in person. Um, at Harvard Business School, Harvard Business School Online, the, the kind of division inside of HBS that I run, it's focused on 
certificate programs. We don't offer any online degrees at HBS. The only way to get a degree is uh, to get the MBA degree by attending on campus for reasons that Mitch pointed out is that uh, we believe there's something unique and special about people being on campus. Um, and so if you're gonna get a degree, that's how you're gonna do it. That said, the work we had done in HBS online over the last five years or so uh, turned out to be very helpful when it came time to try and help transition the MBA program in the spring uh, to an online offering. And now again in the fall, as we, uh, we look to help students there. Um, I know there's a lot of talk in the press about the, the wealth of institutions like Harvard, but uh, just to kind of help people understand how much of a shock this is, Harvard Business School last year had roughly $100 million surplus that it generated on about $800 million in revenue at the school. Uh, this year, it will probably break even simply because the crisis came late in the year, but next year it could be looking at a $50 million deficit. So there's that's that's a big hit, obviously. A lot of that comes from executive education, by the way, and that's heavily international, 60 to 70 percent international. Again, makes it unlikely that's going to come back in the form it did before anytime uh, really soon. So it's a real shock to the system, and that leads me to my kind of final category of comments is just, you know, what does it mean more broadly? Uh, I think certainly smaller institutions that are tuition dependent, uh, this is going to be a really, really difficult uh, time for those institutions. Um, and it's, it's hard to transition to online overnight in a way that's really compelling. I, I think that COVID gave online a boost in some ways, but I do have a concern that because people had to rush to do it, in many quarters, it could actually be a negative over the long term because many students may experience something that they find half-baked because in many cases, by necessity, it was. And so there's going to be uh, a period, I think, where It'll be used because people have to use it. Schools will realize they're going to have to make it better than it probably is today. And hopefully those students that have the bad experience won't you know, label all online learning as, uh, as not a good experience because it is really a great way to learn for many people uh, who either can't make it to campus or like the flexibility uh, it offers. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kathy. Okay, thank you. You all brought up a lot of great points that we'll dive into a little bit more. Um, we are opening the chat function, so anyone who wants to uh, send a question is welcome to do that. This first question, um, I would love to hear from all three of you. Um, Mitch, I'm gonna address it to you first, uh, and it's two questions after a statement. Uh, the stress levels caused in a large part by the pandemic, and you mentioned a bit about this, they're significant. Uh, the rate of youth suicide is already skyrocketing. Many students have family health issues. They have lost their jobs. They have lost their internships. Uh, there's an epidemic of heightened insecurity and downright despair for some people. So two questions to go with that. Number one, what adjustments does higher education need to make to serve the mental health of these students? And number two, what can families do to support their students to foster this, this feeling of resiliency and personal responsibility? Like so much else about the uh, time we're living through, uh, this, this, didn't, this didn't create the uh, phenomena you're talking about or this trend, it's, it accelerated uh, one, just as it did the uh, growth of online learning, possibly the fragility, the financial vulnerability of, of, uh, some, of some colleges. Uh, we've been dealing with this in higher ed uh, uh, to an uh, ever-increasing uh, level over recent years. Um, and there are all sorts of theories as to why young people, uh, somewhat ironically, in the wealthiest, freest, safest the world that humanity's yeah. ever known, are apparently suffering um, more anxiety and, uh, and, and uh, mental disturbances than at least we detected uh, in the past. So uh, every school I know has had to staff up and, and add to its uh, to, to a function that didn't even exist uh, two, three, four decades ago. I'm talking about counseling and psychological help, and we're doing the same. We we had already this is before anyone heard of COVID um, uh, put a a program uh, built on the concept of grit and resilience into our uh, we were building it already on our campus, starting with the freshman orientation, trying to help students feel greater sense of agency, greater sense of responsibility, 
sense that setbacks, uh, particularly at a fairly rigorous school like Purdue, are inevitable. Um, helping them meet students who had overcome um, similar problems before. I guess we're going to have to do a lot more of that. I'll just close by saying what I can't um, speculate on or can't uh, certainly uh, quantify yet is what the what this fall may add to that. We're going to, as I say, make demands on students that have never been made before in terms of uh, uh, they'll have fewer uh, out, uh, outside activities, fewer chances for social interaction. Uh, they'll uh, be asked to undertake things, uh, uh, take your temperature every morning, uh, check your own symptoms, report them, show up for testing uh, uh, when asked. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is going to change the college experience in ways we hope are very temporary, but no question is going to uh, exacerbate a problem that's been growing uh, very fast over recent years on its own. Thank you. Jim or Patrick, uh, any comments on that? Yeah, let me let me build on that. I mean, there's there's obviously consistency of what we're experiencing uh, with uh, it, exactly as Mitch has pointed out. This is an issue we've been confronting well before COVID-19, but indeed uh, the pandemic has exacerbated these these problems. I I know there was I think about three four years ago we had a year long thing on our campus called the Brain Project where we had a number of healthcare professionals, neurologists, and those that were uh, you know, very familiar with, with uh, brain health, mental health issues, um, just to have these types of conversations. Part, part of uh, taking away the stigma of mental health issues is conversations and making sure that your students are comfortable uh, seeking assistance. And we've really uh, invested quite a bit, and we have been, uh, just because of the, uh, the nature, I would say, of the generation we're, we're, we're uh, having on our, on our campuses and our responsibility, uh, both inside and outside of the classroom. We started an initiative last year called the BU Be Well initiative uh, uh, that's been part of that to talk about physical and psychological health. And, and uh, we've been enhanced um, um, our, our counsel, counseling. And uh, we've done this even during uh, the last few months when students were off campus to make sure that they had uh, uh, the ability to call in for help for us to provide professionals to them as they were coping with uh, both the pandemic and the transition and maybe living with their families again added to some of the stress levels. So I, I'm sure it did for parents as well. So uh, indeed, this is a big issue. We've got to be very mindful of it. Uh, we're educating students, mind, body, heart, and soul. And, and uh, we have to really uh, be uh, careful about it, uh, you know, providing the support that we uh, we're obligated uh, and really we need to do for our students. Yeah, yeah. Patrick, what about the families? What role do, do the parents of the students have in this or, or are there resources or uh, places we can go to to get information? I mean, as a parent myself of a college student, my daughter's at Notre Dame, um, I see this in, in her and younger employees as well. Um, I, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. I do think, uh, to the point that Jim and Mitch both made, there's something generational about a discomfort with ambiguity. And if there was ever a moment in our history where there's a lot of ambiguity, it's right now. And so I think that this is, uh, and I see it in my, you know, my own daughter, who, who, by the way, is more worried about whether football season is going to happen, about whether there's going to be a graduation ceremony, and <laughs> she's a senior. Um, so as am I, by the way. Uh, so, um, you know, I think that as, as uh, parents, to some extent, by the time your kid is 18, the ship has sailed in a great way. So I think it's a lot of kind of continuous communication that hopefully is helping direct and also make clear as much as my daughter hates it when she probably is being a little unreasonable about something that's really bothering her. And, and to uh, Mitch's point, you know, taking some agency, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that kids will put on themselves that they could take off of themselves as well. And I know it, um, and I'm sure this is true at, at virtually every uh, university in the country, given the prevalence of this issue, we, we have online resources and in-person resources on campus to help students who, who are struggling. And I think that's going to be more important than ever here in the, especially in the fall term. Absolutely. Uh, Jim, I'll start with you on this one. What are your predictions about fall enrollment? Do you think more people will choose regional campuses or community colleges? Uh, what's your view on that? Well, there, there's been a number of very credible surveys out there around that and where families maybe 
20, 25% might be looking to make uh, uh, some change with being close, closer to home, uh, being one of the uh, 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 dominant uh, selections. And so we are seeing some shifting around. Uh, we're seeing more transfers, uh, increased transfers at Butler. We're also seeing incredibly strong uh, enrollment numbers, as I know many colleges, including Purdue, I've talked to Mitch about this, have uh, have experience. So families definitely want the education and they, they might make some changes. Some are going to opt, I think, to take off um, uh, in the fall, maybe into the spring, as uh, there's no doubt this uncertainty is going to uh, continue for quite some time. Um, and, and so, you know, my prediction, one, we could, we could see some of the patterns, but at the same time, um, there are a lot of unknowns, right? And, and uh, uh, what, what, uh, we're about six weeks away from the beginning of, of the semester and uh, anything could happen between now and then. So the number one thing at the end of the day in terms of making the decisions and responding to those families that are making these choices is we really have to care about the, their safety and the safety of everyone in our, our community and surrounding. So, um, but in, in, indeed, I think you're going to see some changes. I do think uh, the opening of more, more exposure to online education. Uh, we were already confronting, you know, the, there's been a lot of changes in the uh, perceptions about uh, living in cam on a campus and versus online education. Different forms of education are indeed uh, part of what uh, of the reality today. So I think you're going to see a swifter move uh, to uh, to more online as as uh, time progresses. Uh, and this has probably accelerated uh, the open-mindedness to different forms of education. We've been moving very aggressively ourselves uh, in making sure that we have more than just the on-campus educational experience, but for those that are interested in it, to make sure that they could um, have a hybrid approach, whether it's partially online or partially on campus, but just to make sure that the array of educational opportunities are, are out there uh, dependent on how students uh, uh, choose to be educated as they move forward. Absolutely. Mitch Daniels, uh, predominantly online schools have started to present fully virtual hybrid learning offerings. How will this impact your brand at Purdue? Depends, like everything else depends how we handle it. Uh, you know, there's nothing new about the, so, not at Purdue at least, about the so-called hybrid model to which uh, almost everybody is, is now migrating. Uh, uh, last year, for instance, uh, last year's graduates, more than 90% had had at least one online class. Sometimes in the summer, we have record enrollment, by the way, this summer, and it's all online. Um, but uh, sometimes while on campus, that'll be um, uh, increasing this year. Uh, we expect that every uh, undergraduate student here will have at least one online class. On the other hand, we uh, will take every step we can to make sure that they have a preponderance of uh, classes that are at least in in part uh, in person and and uh, it, it, at least uh, as, as we now say hybrid. So again, it, it's a uh, a pattern, a trend that was there that's that's been propelled by these events. And but I think that's very very helpful. It's been said for a very long time. You know, when was higher ed going to get the memo about the possible efficiency advantages that come from technology. And uh, aside from folks like Patrick who are out pioneering in this area, they're, uh, they're, it's been way too slow. And now um, necessity has, has uh, brought it forward. I thought Patrick made a really perceptive point in that uh, the experience, we might have taken a half a step back because the experience that too many people had this uh, spring um, was a very poor one. Um, and uh, it, it's no one's fault, but particularly the, those high school students, uh, high schools had no way to be prepared for this and very little experience with it. But it's very clear to us that uh, those who, uh, whose ex the first encounter with online education came as a high school student and probably had a lousy um, experience with it and uh, are very eager for something else. I, I hope we'll show them a much a uh, more engaging and effective uh, version when they get here. But um, yeah, I, I think a lot of schools, if you ask about brand or the questioner does, uh, brand is up for grabs based on how well the, uh, we do or don't manage this uh, 
uh, this brand new situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it, just one quick comment on that brand question, Kathy. Certainly that was a huge question when Harvard Business School Online was started. You know, there was this fear that, you know, you, you basically built a brand around kind of an elite selective, um, you know, stature, if you will. And, um, and what's interesting, when I talk to alumni every year during reunions, I point out that the, the selectivity came about because simply because of capacity. You only have so many seats in a classroom and you have, if you have more applicants than you do seats, you're by definition going to be at some level uh, selective. But if you're a mission-driven institution and you believe what you have to offer makes the world a better place, and I certainly believe that you know, business and capitalism done well do make the world a better place, then it would almost be immoral of us not to find ways to reach more people. And uh, to Mitch's point, if you do it well, there could be nothing better uh, for your brand. Um, but you need to be conscious of that doing it well part. Yes. What's the financial impact of going on more online? I don't know that, you know, um, j just uh, as we've been looking at uh, and expanding our forms of education, uh, I don't think that the costs are going to go down and, you know, again, to this point of quality being, uh, being critical, uh, it, 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 uh, if you want to do it right, you've got to make the investment and, and uh, you, you've, you also need to invest in your faculty. That's another uh, thing that I, uh, we haven't mentioned as much, but obviously the faculty side of this is so critical and, and uh, we've got outstanding faculty, and, but you also want to support them as, as uh, educational mo modalities evolve over time. Um, but one of the hopes too, I mean, to look at it from another side, uh, making that investment, hopefully at the other end, is going to expand the opportunity for education. The, those are having a, those people that are having a hard time affording it. I, I've made a point in, in uh, our new strategy as we've been moving forward that uh, our founding mission was to provide access to education to people regardless of their backgrounds. Uh, and, and we need to expand that as the cost of private education has gone, has increased so significantly. Uh, the way for our country to get out of where they're at today is to expand education and to make sure that the population is educated. And that is our mission and that's our moral obligation too uh, as, as universities. And I, I could tell you in conversations I have with many presidents, we're very mindful of that. I think the, the, the mission side of this is there's been increased in increasing cost and increase in tuition. Uh, you know, what gets lost in that is that many of us are working hard to try to use technology and, and other means uh, to make sure that we could expand access to education and to make sure that people aren't priced out of, uh, of higher education. Yeah. All said. Comments, and uh, Jim, I think you said a, a bit about it, but maybe uh, from all three of you on international students, what, what's your prediction this year uh, regarding international students coming in or going more to online and, and go forward after this year? Uh, Jim, I'll start with you. Well, uh, many of us, uh, at least on this side of the panel, are aware of uh, uh, some guidance that came out yesterday in terms of those uh, uh, international students that are not going to be at a campus uh, uh, where courses are primarily online are, are going to be, uh, their, their visas are going to uh, be revoked. And so therefore, uh, that's a very concerning thing. I talk about our people and we care about all of our people, you know, with whether they're from uh, across, uh, across the ocean, international, or, or here in our own backyards. And so it's disappointing to know that uh, some of our international students are going to be confronting these challenges. And so I think there's, there's, uh, and, and there's, some rationale for, for some of this, I get it, but at the same time, we want to provide this education uh, uh, to students. So, you know, that diversity that you have on your campus is so important to the quality of the, of the experience. And, and, uh, and it's tough when you have students that might be now having that particular challenge. So it's becoming more difficult, obviously, because of, of travel restrictions, which are understandable in the face of a pandemic. Um, but uh, it, yes, indeed, there's some uh, significant obstacles. We don't have nearly as many international students are on our campus as, as uh, Mitch does at, at Purdue, but it is a complication right now, for sure. Mitch, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, big issue. Uh, about 10 to 12 percent of our undergrads and a higher percentage of our graduate students come from some other country. Uh, a very large, uh, one thing is very, very clear, they very much want to be here. 
and um, we had uh, a, a deposits there set a, a record just as in other categories. Uh, it's now equally clear that a high, high percentage of them will not be able to get here. So of the roughly 10%, I'll guess, something like that of our uh, undergrads who are going to take the online option that I mentioned, a high percentage of those will be international students, not because they don't want to come, or are fearful of coming, but because they are physically can't get here. And um, uh, so we look forward to the day when they can get here, but uh, we'll do our best with the, uh, uh, the online uh, capabilities that we've been developing anyway, to uh, allow them to, uh, and, and others who choose. We have said, for instance, to domestic students or students of all kinds that uh, if, you, uh, if you have any of these uh, uh, health uh, challenges that have been associated with somewhat greater risk, you ought to think about an online option until until um, uh, better times um, come uh, arrive medically. So uh, uh, we, we will know literally a lot more in just a few days than we do now, but we're beginning to see uh, the pattern that I describe. And um, uh, the happy news from our standpoint is that it does appear they want to pursue a Purdue education, even if it has to start or have a, uh, its next uh, increment uh, being uh, remote. Yeah. Patrick, you, I think you mentioned this briefly and just wanted to um, allow you and anyone else to weigh in on that. The fact that we talked about the perils of schools in general, that we're already on a difficult financial footing when this happened. And has the pandemic created a situation that could likely be a mortal threat to some of these schools? Yeah, I mean, it almost certainly has. Um, and in fact, uh, a lot of tuition dependent schools also, uh, tying it to our last topic, um, uh, kind of balance budgets on uh, the backs of uh, foreign students who are paying you know, full tuition. So th there might be a double whammy here and that you're you're not going to have as many enrolled students, and then uh, those that were paying full vote um, aren't going to be able to show up on campus. Um, I, I, you know, certainly there were a lot of schools that were were probably already on a trajectory where one day they would have to consider consolidating uh, or shutting down. I I can't imagine this won't um, accelerate that, um, and I think that uh, you know to some extent um, if this you know, dribbles on into the spring. Uh, you know, maybe there's a lot that can get by on a semester or two, but if this dribbles on for a lot, lot longer, I think it becomes even more challenging for um, a lot of institutions. Yeah, Kathy, let me, let me just uh, affirm what Patrick just said. Uh, once again, with, with uh, uh, the declining uh, overall uh, uh, demographics in the traditional uh, age group, with escalating costs, which has uh, caused the many an increasing, polls tell us, an increasing percentage of American parents and students to, to doubt the value, at least of higher ed at, at certain price levels. And now this on top, um, I think in our prep talk, I told, I told you all I've been thinking of some of our fine um, but vulnerable uh, uh, private schools as the 80-year-old, you know, congestive heart failure patients of of, uh, of this situation. That is, they were already very vulnerable and we were worried about them. And now this, uh, this uh, epidemic uh, could uh, prove fatal. Uh, I'll just report to you that I've already encountered the first group of, uh, of uh, venture capitalists who have assembled a very large amount of money to buy campuses that go uh, out of business and uh, repurpose them or, or restart them on a different business model uh, for a higher education. And uh, that, that tells you that, uh, that the questioner um, is onto something. Yeah. yeah. Jim? Well, you know, there's no, I'm, I'm not sure I could add a lot to what's been said. Indeed, it's, it's uh, even as I mentioned for a butler, you know, we're, we're smaller private, but we've been very fortunate, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, our own stature and national recognition that's put us in a good place, uh, financially speaking. And, but we have had to do what many campuses have had to do. Uh, uh, we, we've had to go through a series of furloughs and layoffs and uh, cut budgets and, and 
travel and all kinds of other things. I mean, you, you do the obvious things first in budget cutting and you, you do everything you can to protect uh, uh, the people that you have. If this thing goes on for, for a year or two, uh, you know, every university, even this, even Harvard, although I'm not so sure I was real sympathetic with the uh, gross revenue numbers you were kicking around there, but, but uh, uh, we are gonna be challenged uh, uh, for sure, the longer this goes on. Be, and, and if we want to do education right or compete with those venture capitalists, we're going to have to step up our game. So it's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of coming at us in both, uh, in both directions. We already were confronting as an industry, uh, you know, these rising cost of tuition and demographic challenges and everything else happening. And this is an overlay onto that. And, and uh, people were already predicting 25 or a third of uh, universities might go away over time. So, uh, you know, we're well prepared to weather the storm, but boy, it's, uh, it's a big storm and there's gonna be a lot of uh, universities that are not gonna be around if this thing sustains much longer, right? Yeah, very tough. Well, we are at the end of our time. Uh, although I'm sure I, I, there are so many questions I did not get to here. I apologize to the audience. I think we caught some of them though. Thank you gentlemen uh, for taking the time to speak to all of us today. Your comments were so important and thought provoking. And we all, I can speak for everyone. We appreciate your courage and your willingness to make the tough decisions in this, in this very difficult time. Um, a recording of today's discussion will be available online at Economic Club Indiana of Indiana.com. And if you missed the first two virtual events in the summer series, you can find them online as well. Please join us for our summer series finale on Wednesday, July 29th, as we have a conversation on resilience and community health with the CEO of the American Red Cross of Greater Indianapolis, Chad Priest. Have a wonderful afternoon and thank you everybody.